Uh, today, this message you might say, ooh. You say there's good news though. It's going to be on bitter consequences. But there's good news in the gospel, amen? Yeah. But, you know, when we read the word of God, we like to say, oh, there's good things in the word of God. There's all the good promises of God. But there are also warnings in the word of God. And if we don't heed the warnings, it's just like, uh, I'll tell all myself, I ran a stop sign. Yeah, in Sturgis. You know, you come through the south of Sturgis, there's stoplights all the way. There's that one stop. Anybody know the one I'm talking about? Well, one stop sign. Stoplights are this way, but one stop sign. Now, I'm totally oblivious. I'm, I've been watching the stoplights. I know it's there. But I look down and I see the last stoplight and I'm watching that. And just as I'm going through, Lori says, Woo! You're going through the stop, what, stop sign. I'm like, I went through the stop sign. Praise God, nobody hit us. <clears throat> like, oh well. See, I didn't heed the warnings. I didn't heed the warning. I didn't get a ticket, but I didn't heed the warning. Praise God, I didn't get a ticket. I'm glad for that. But I would have had no excuse because I didn't heed the warning. So today, we're going to talk a little bit more about bitterness, but from a different aspect. Last week, I talked some about unforgiveness and what it does and how we can get rid of it. But in Hebrews 12, it says, Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. So, in a, there's effort involved. Living at peace and living a holy life means that we have to put a little effort into it. Even though our, our salvation is through grace, we can't work for it. It doesn't mean that afterwards that we don't have to do something. And a warning is for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. And being holy means set aside for the Lord. Set aside. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God or falls short of the grace of God. So God has got all this grace available to us, but there's a, there's, we can fall short of receiving it. We could fall short of receiving all the good things of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. And it goes on to talk about how Esau didn't esteem his birthright. He didn't esteem what God had for him, what his father had for him. And we don't always esteem the grace of God. And he missed out. And it got to be too late. He missed out on everything. Even though he cried over it, it was too late. In the Fresh Start Bible, it's... I'm, Put this in, The Bitter Roots by Robert Morris. When we've been hurt by another person or believe God has wronged us in some way, we can become angry and bitter. However, Hebrews 12, 15 warns us against the poisonous root of bitterness. Bitterness is a poison that will ruin our lives if we let it go unchecked. Not only ruin our lives, but it can ruin the church. Amen. It can... You know, we want God to move. We want to move with the Holy Spirit. We want to see signs, wonders, and miracles. And yet, I think God's also saying, be careful, because if there's one thing that's going to stop a move of God, it is bitterness. So bitter roots deceive is the first thing he put in there. You know, how do you know you're, when you're deceived? Anybody know how you know if you're deceived? Believe something other than the truth. Yep, but do you know you're deceived? Many times, we don't know we're deceived. You don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. The only, the only way you can know if you're deceived is by knowing a truth. You know, there's a difference between truth and lies, right? So, truth is truth, lies are lies. That's deception, and so, 
When we know the word of God, we can keep from being deceived. Bitter roots corrupt. I wrote down to files all those who get close enough to allow it to. I'll, I broke down a couple of words, gossiping and complaining. I found out that when I go to places where gossip is going, uh, I've had to just stop going there, you know. Because gossip, there are people, have you ever sat in a place and somebody's gossiping and people lean in? Because I want to hear what, what the latest, juiciest thing is. I hear or complaining. How many, you know, we could fall into the trap of complaining, griping, moaning, groaning, singing the blues. And sometimes we can get into that trap and then we like to be around people like that, you know. But bitter roots depress. The root of bitterness is envy, and the root of envy is hate. Bitterness is a poison that produces deception, defilement, and depression. We all have had difficult, even painful experiences, but we cannot afford to become bitter. We don't like to think about our bitterness as being hate. Hatred, but in the reality it is hatred. But the good news is we must choose to let Jesus heal these areas of our lives and remove any bitter roots in our hearts. And that's the good news of the gospel. Another where to watch over one another with jealous care lest anyone leave the faith. The root of bitterness is a deliberate turning away from God as exemplified by the disobedience of Israel in the wilderness. You notice the term disobedience. Such sin contaminates the entire Christian community. Because God does not want us to go there because God has big plans. How many of you believe that God has big plans for you? Yeah. Come on, I ought to see more hands than that. How many of you believe God has big plans for you? Amen. How many of you believe that God has big plans for the body of Christ? Amen. Amen. Are you part of the body of Christ? Yes. Okay, God has big plans. But you know what? The devil wants to derail that. He wants to stop it. He wants to make sure that those big plans don't happen. Amen? Amen. So that's why we need to be aware. We need to watch for the warnings. So we don't fall into the trap. James 3, 13 through 18. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with what? Humility that comes from wisdom. If there is a cure for bitterness, it's humility. It's when we humble ourselves before the Lord and we ask for his wisdom. Humility is the cure. It's one of the cures. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and what? Demonic. Demonic. So you know the devil's behind it. He tries to ensnare us and get us in a trap and cause all types of mischief, destruction, because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Kingdom Dynamics says whenever God moves by the Spirit, the efforts of the adversary will manifest in many ways in order to seek to stamp the flow of what? Divine grace. See, God wants to flow through you. He wants his grace to flow through you. There's, what came to me is this. Grace and bitterness are opposites. 
Grace and bitterness are opposite things. Have you ever heard somebody say that we need to grace people? What does that mean? It means that we are patient with them and we're kind with them and we don't run down their shortcomings. We're not quick to, to run around to other people and point out somebody else's shortcomings. We grace them. We grace them. It's as simple as this. You go into a restaurant and it's chaotic. And service takes a long time. And, and you, you're watching the time and it's getting to be how long is this going to take. But when you look and really look and you see what the waitresses are trying to do, trying to, we see it even locally, they're trying to take orders, get drinks, bus tables, bring out the drinks, bring out the food, and it's chaos. Do we get upset or do we grace? Do we grace? What if we practice the grace of God flowing through our lives and we grace people? Grace means I'm kind to them, I'm patient with them. Back to James, it says in verse 17, but the wisdom from above, above is first of all pure, is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others, is full of mercy, and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism, and is always sincere, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. I wrote down that fleshly gratification is the root of bitterness. When we become bitter, then we become self-justifying. I have a right to my opinion. I have a right to the way I feel. I have been hurt, I have been offended, I don't agree with that decision, or I want control. And that is not what Scripture says, because the Scripture says, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I take up my cross daily. I die to myself. And that means I put others first. Amen? Amen. James 4. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. Go on. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. But here's the great news. And he gives grace generously. Last week I talked about it. He gives grace generously. Amen. God is not a... God when he gives his grace to us. And then the scripture says, God opposes the prophet, gives grace to who? The humble. the humble. So if we humble ourselves before God, his grace comes, and then it says, so humble yourself before God, and then what happens? We can resist the devil. Then we can resist the devil. And he will flee. That's when our power comes. That's when we have power over the enemy. Is when we humble ourselves before God. And we say, Lord, forgive me for anything in me. 
there, James goes on to talk about the spirit of repentance, how we need to repent, how we turn our hearts towards God and we say, God, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know I was this way. Many times we don't know that we're bitter or we don't know that there's these things in our lives. But when we turn to God, he, when we ask him to search our heart, like we say, cleanse me, O Lord, search my heart today, when he searches our heart and we get rid of it, then the grace can flow. And the joy comes. And the peace comes. Amen? Amen. And the power comes. Verse 11 in that passage says, Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. What is that law? It's the law of love in Christ Jesus. It's loving each other. Remember, in January I spoke, what if we, as the church, were baptized with a baptism of love and we became a loving church? I'm not saying we aren't, but couldn't we be more loving? Look at the book of Acts church. There was a baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I think what really brought people to Christ was love. People loved each other. They gave up things for each other. They sold things. They took care of each other because they loved each other. That's the law of love. Share a quick, just a quick story of what happens when this doesn't occur. It's happened in a church. They started small groups. And there were a group of people probably, I don't know how many couples, going to the small group. And things were going well. The church was growing. It was starting to boom. They were probably at their highest numbers they'd ever been at. But one small group, the leader, started complaining about the pastor and said the pastor isn't, he isn't a spiritual. He isn't a spiritual. He isn't, he doesn't understand the deep spiritual things. He isn't living up to expectations. And this person led all these couples away. But what happened was the damage that was done, if you don't think this is serious, I'll tell you what the damage of this happening caused. More than one of those couples divorced. Their children are no longer living for the Lord. I think a couple of the men died early deaths, sudden early deaths. Hell, seemed to be healthy, but died. None of these people really ever came back to it that I'm aware of a deep relationship with the Lord. But it wounded the church cause long-lasting issues to the point that any type of outreach small groups was thought of as dangerous and it took years to overcome this caused division in the church their numbers which had been at their highest probably fell by a good third more you see when we the warning in the Word of God is we need to guard ourselves. And we want to see the grace of God flow, right? Amen. Amen. The grace of God has to flow. You can read the rest of these scriptures later. I want to close with one area that we don't think about. And that's towards the bottom of the second page talking about 
sin and sickness. 1 John 5 says, And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when he make, we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. We like that. That is great. Those are great verses. But then it says, if you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying that you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin. Not every sin leads to death. I don't understand that verse very well, to be honest with you. Really don't. But I have a book. It's called The More Excellent Way, Be in Health, Spiritual Roots of Disease, Pathway, Pathways to Wholeness. And I was reading, and I was checking out the whole thing about bitterness, because, you know, bitterness causes sickness. You know, if you're bitter inside, uh, when, I, when I was, let's say, bitter inside, I got stomach problems. How many of you ever have a stomach problem? Usually stomach issues come from some type of anxiety issue or just you're in turmoil inside. But what he said in there, he said, I don't understand this verse well either. But this is the question that came. Can the reason that we don't see more people healed when we pray for them is that there is a root of bitterness, guilt, shame, self-hatred, or lust, that has opened the door for sicknesses. Remember when Jesus healed the man at the pool and Jesus healed him and he said, you want to be made well? Remember the guy who was waiting to dive into the pool and the angel stirred the water up? And Jesus came along and Jesus healed him? But then later, Jesus found him in the crowd and he said, go and sin no more lest something worse comes. Sometimes we have to search our heart and say, Lord, is there any wicked way in me that I, can, I need to repent of, that you can cleanse me of, so that I can receive your healing and your grace? Amen? You understand? then we can be open conduits for God's grace and God's healing. I know this is heavy. I know this isn't like a, you know. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus can take care of all of us. <clears throat> Jesus can take care of all of it. Doesn't have to be an issue in our lives. Amen? How many of you like not to have that be an issue in your life? You don't want bitterness, and you don't want unforgiveness, and you don't want to be grumpy and groaning and moaning and singing the blues all the time. Amen? Amen? You don't want to be that person when they see you come and say, oh boy, there they come. You ever had somebody? Oh boy. I don't want to be that way. I want to be filled with the joy of the Lord and the grace of God. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to go to prayer. I'm going to ask you this question. You got, you maybe got something in your life and you say, Lord, I know it's hindering me. I don't want it there. Maybe it's not bitterness. Maybe it's, maybe you're feeling guilt. Maybe you're feeling shame. Maybe you're, Maybe you don't even realize it, but you don't really love it yourself. You feel self-hatred towards yourself. Do you know that that's a devil's work? Because God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that life is not that, not in bondage. Correct. Amen. You're not to be in bondage. You're supposed to have the joy of the Lord, the joy of your salvation. Remember that song? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Right? How many do you like the joy of your salvation back? 
Or maybe you've never encountered the Jesus. You've never put your faith in him. You don't have the joy. You don't understand what that means. Today is the day you can put your faith in Christ. Today is the day you can ask him to cleanse you of your sins. Today is the day that he can put the joy of, the, of salvation in your heart and change you if you ask and believe. So first of all, every eye closed, I want, if somebody you're here and you don't, you haven't put your faith in Christ, you don't know the joy of salvation, you've never encountered it, I want you to raise your hand because we're going to pray. God's going to save you. God's going to set you free. God's going to forgive your sins. God's going to give you a new life and you're going to be a new creation. Amen? Amen. So do you need that? Nobody looking around wants you to raise your hand. Because today is your day. But that's for anybody that's wanting to watch this too. Today is your day. Okay, here's the other thing. You realize that this is maybe stepped on your toes and you say, God, I don't want this. I want to be so full of the, full of the, I want to be so full of the joy of the Lord and the grace of God pouring out of me that I am just the, not just the conduit that it flows through, but I'm an attractive, I am, I am attracted to people. People come to me because I'm full of the grace and the love and the joy of the Lord. And you would say that you want that, would you raise your hand? And to be honest with you, we all ought to raise our hand and say, God, that's what I want in my life. Amen? Amen. I want that. All right, well, Lord, in Jesus' name, we want that. So if search our hearts and see if there's any wicked ways in us. Because the good news is that we can be free. So in Jesus' name, would you free us? And if that's you, I want you to say out loud, Lord, okay, everybody say this, Lord, Lord. Set, me free. set me free, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. I, confess. I confess, I want it gone. I want it gone. Now, I'm going to say that again, but when I say I confess, I want, I'm going to give you a moment and then you you don't have to shout it, but you can just speak it in a whisper or whatever to the Lord if you want to. But say, Lord, I, I confess, and it's whatever it is, set me free. So right now, I confess. Please set me free. In Jesus' name. I surrender to you. Let your grace flow through me and the joy of the Lord will be my strength in Jesus name Amen God wants God has big plans for you God loves you if you could see the plans God has God has got for you you'd probably Pass off. But it's true. And I believe that. I believe in you. I believe that God has big plans for you. And then you should wake up every morning with a smile because you're going to walk into those plans every day you live for Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.